Ladies and gentlemen, usually uh, serious, uh, serious presentations, I don't involve jokes, but I would like to start with a joke. An Israeli businessman sits in Al Al about to land in JFK, and he fills the form for the migration, give a name, Moshe, family name, Cohen. Uh, age, 38. Occupation, no, Tel Aviv. This joke is also based on the fact that Israelis do not master English that way. <laughs> he thinks that occupation has only one, one meaning. Yet, when we come to the occupation of what we talk about, it's a much more serious, serious thing. First of all, um, there is a debate even within the Palestinian arena, what is the occupation? Is the occupation what happened in 1967? Means the territories which were annexed or which were taken by Israel in the Six Day War in 1967, namely Judean Samaria, Sinai, which was meanwhile left by Israel, and the Golan Heights, which are still under Israeli rule. Or whether is it the occupation of 1948? Means the whole Israel as it was between 48 and 67 is also an occupation. If you heard about a guy named Azmi Bishara, who was one of the Knesset members, ran away when uh, investigation uh, about him found that he supported Hezbollah in the war of 2006, so they ran away from the country, and the country allowed him to run away in order not to bring him to court to expose all the evidence which Israel has against him because the Shabak preferred not to expose the evidence. So they let him run away, and that's it. He, as a Christian, by the way, a Knesset member, promoted the idea the occupation is 1948. Not 67, because Israel, to begin with, has no right to exist even if it was in the size of a letter stamp on the seashore of Tel Aviv. This is the occupation. And what he kept saying all the time, that the Zionists are so witty, are so clever, are so bright that they succeeded to convince the world that the occupation is 67 and not 48. Means that Israel in the borders as it had between 48 and 67 is legitimate. He kept saying Israelis are the brightest people on, the earth, on earth. Because something which is totally illegitimate, the state of Israel to begin with, they succeeded to convince the world that this is legitimate. So, uh, in, in, immediately when we talk about occupation, occupation is what are we talking about? Which parts of the land of Israel? Then, don't forget that uh, occupation, by definition, is a situation where state A occupies areas which belong to state B. This occupation, okay? means that the land should be uh, belonging from the sovereignty point of view to state B, and state A comes and occupies these lands which belong to state B, okay? However, what happened in, in the land of Israel, either 48 and 67, and I exclude here the Golan and Sinai, I'm talking about the Judea and Samaria. There was no sovereignty on this part of the world 
to any state in the world. So how possibly can you define it according to the international law as occupation? Neither the occupation of 48 nor the occupation of 67 when it comes to Judea and Samaria. And here a footnote, the Golan until this very day is Syrian soil. What Israel did in 1981, the Choka Golan, the Golan law, did not change the status of the sovereignty over the Golan. It changed something else. We'll not get into this. But is, even in, in, in Israel, we know that a, a so, sovereignty over a land has to go through an agreement between two countries, which agree to move a land from country to country, and this agreement must get the consent of the Security Council of the United Nations. This is how, since 1945, since the United Nations were established, this is how you move, how you move a land from country to country, uh, 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 and this is international law. Did, it did not happen in the Golan, because there is no agreement between Israel and Syria. Israel took it by force in 1967, and Israel keeps it until nobody knows when. Okay? So, from this point of view, we have to admit, yes, the Golan is not under Israeli sovereignty. It is not recognized by any state in the world. Trump recently said something that he supports, uh, but the fact that a president as mighty as he can be, supports the Israeli will to, to remain in the Golan forever, does not change the legal status of the Golan. So I'm not talking about Golan. Sinai anyway we gave back. So what, what, what we remain from the occupation of 67 is the West Bank, as they call it, or Judea Samaria, as they should call it. So in this, since no state in the world had any sovereignty over this part of the world, no, no one can say that this is occupied. From which country? State A took it from State B. Okay? So by definition, it cannot be a, 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 a occupation. It is area in dispute, according to the international law. However, however, we should all, we should all remember what happened in 1917, the, the Balfour Declaration, which became an international document in the San Remo Convention of 1920, and later agreements between United States and Britain in 1924, which actually gave the, what is today between the, uh, the sea and the river, means the Jordan River, the only group in the world which can testified that it were given to it is the Jewish people. You and me alike. Means only the Jews have an international document, which is valid until this very day, that this land should be given to the Jewish people. Of course, originally it included Jordan as well. Later, Jordan was cut off from this part. So at least between the river and the sea is the area which was given internationally only to the Jewish people. And on this you can read the magnificent book of written by, uh, by uh, uh, Solomon ben Zimra of blessed memory who lived in this town and was published by, uh, by the CIA Canadians for Israel Legal Rights headed by Goldie Steiner. And uh, recently it was published in Hebrew in Israel by Im Tirzu and many Israelis today are exposed to this uh, kind of interpretation. Yet we have to admit that not all the judicial world agrees with this. It is a theory which uh, some jurists st stood behind it, like Howard Grief, Jacques Autier, who lives in this town, uh, and, and others, uh, including Judah Bloom, who served as the uh, chief of the judicial department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel, and later he became the representative of Israel in the United Nations in the 80s. So he was also one of this uh, school of uh, teaching. Uh, yet, we have to admit that there are uh, jurists in the world who do not agree to this uh, theory, and this is a dispute between jurists. 
Ladies and gentlemen, occupation, let's assume that we talked about this. There is a lot more to say more about occupation. I want to go to other part, and this is the lies which are being told about Israel and about what Israel is and what happens there. Um, and here, uh, there is a plethora of lies which really you don't know where to start and you don't know when to finish. Let me show you some of the examples of lies which uh, are today in the air and they are repeated just like what uh, Goebbels said that a lie, if you repeat a lie a thousand times, it becomes truth. a truth. And this is actually what people are doing. First of all, let's look at maps. Maps. You know, maps do mean uh, something. Uh, when you look at the Jordanian maps of Judea and Samaria, as they call, of uh, West Bank, as they call it, because Jordan is divided in the East Bank to the east from Jordan, and the West Bank. This is where the, the term West Bank came from, from Jordanian occupation, and this was, was an occupation because this part of the, of the land was given to the Jews. Yet the, the Jordanian army, the Jordanian legion, headed by the British, headed by the British gov uh, uh, commandment, Glab Pasha, uh, occupied parts of Eretz Israel. And here we have to commemorate that this occupation of Jordan to the West Bank, as they called it, was not recognized not only by the world, <coughs> even the Arab world did not recognize the legitimacy of the Jordanian occupation of the West Bank. People are not aware of it. People say, oh, Jordan controlled the West Bank. Controlled by occupation. First of all, in the whole world, only two countries recognized it. Britain and Pakistan. And in the Arab world, not even one country recognized the legitimacy of the presence of Jordan in the West Bank between 1948 and 1967. So we have to bear it in mind, because when Jordanians today talk about the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, what were, what were they in the West Bank, as they call it? Occupiers as well. Okay? So sometimes, you know, a camel doesn't see his... Humps. His... Humps. Humps. Okay? Because it's... <laughs> So, this is, by the way, Jordanians, and when I appear in Jordanian media, and they keep telling me, why don't you establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank, as they call it, and Jerusalem, is Jerusalem as its capital? I always tell them, why didn't you do it? <laughs> after all, after all, they occupied the West Bank, as they call it, and is Jerusalem, for 19 years. 19 years, it's more or less 7,000 days. They had 7,000 opportunities to do exactly what they demand Israel to do today. Why didn't they do it? When they could. Okay? The Arab world calls us as well to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Jerusalem as the capital. Why didn't the same Arab world maintain the same pressure on Jordan to do exactly the same thing? If there was a Palestinian nation and if there was a, 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 a reason why to establish a Palestinian state. They started to demand only when we liberated that part of Eretz Israel. Okay? The world, European countries, also people here who think that there should be a Palestinian state. Why didn't they say the same thing when Jordan occupied the West Bank and, okay, so this is some kind of hypocrisy, maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jordan was there in that area, Jordan published, uh, uh, published this book. Uh, 
This book, Guide to the West Bank of Jordan, Jerusalem, this was published in 1963. Uh, this is the book. You can see it on the screen. This is the book. Uh, 1963 means four years before we liberated Jerusalem. The first page of this booklet has a map attached to it. I also took picture of the map. And the map is this. Okay? Let's look at this map from This is the Temple Mount. What is written on it in English? Mount Moriah. Hara Moriah. The Dome of the Rock is in the middle. And Al-Aqsa Mosque is in the south, in the southern part of this court. Okay? Solomon's stables, Uvot Shlomo, Valley of Jehoshaphat, Tomb of Zachariah, Absalom's Pillar, Mount Zion. And this is an official book and official map of the Jordanian Ministry of Tourism. Okay? Means the Jordanians, when they were controlling Jerusalem, they had no problem to show half of the Bible on the map. Of course, there are also Christian things here. Okay? Because this is the history which the whole world agrees upon. This is not the only map which talks about Mount Moriah. Let me show you a couple of more. Uh, this is a map which belongs to a friend of mine who lives in New York. It's a tourism map. Here, it's even open. It's not even with initials. Mount Moriah. See? And again, the Al-Aqsa is the mosque which is built in the southern part of the Temple Mount with, topped by the silver, silver dome, as opposed to the golden dome which is in the center of the court. Okay? And this is in every Jordanian map which was published prior to 1967. Al-Aqsa in the south, and the, mount, and the place is Mount Moriah. Okay? After 1967, the maps are changed. Because now, they cannot take it. The fact that we are there in... Look at this now. What happened, what happened is, first of all, Mount Moriah disappeared. <laughs> this is in Arabic. Al-Aqsa, which was this building all the years, the building in the south part of the court, now the whole court is called Al-Majid Al-Aqsa. Not only the building in the south, the whole Harabai, the whole Temple Mount, no, more, no Mount Moria, now it's called Al-Aqsa. And what is the name of the mosque in the south? It changed the name. Now it has Al-Masjid Al-Kibli. Means the mosque of the direction of the prayer. Because they pray to the south, to Mecca. So now the, 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 the mosque, which is built in the southern part of the court, has the name of the mosque of the direction of the prayer. Because now the Al-Aqsa was employed to... Name the whole court, which is 144 dollars. Why did it happen? And it appears on all the maps. The modern maps after 67. Means forging maps. Something which was correct before 67. Now it changed. Why did they change it? What made them change it? What happened is in 67, after Israel liberated Jerusalem, 
or the east part of Jerusalem. Two Rabbanim, Rabbi Gorem, who was then the rabbi of the army, and Rabbi Sh'ar Yeshuv Kohen, the rabbi of Haifa, who was his brother-in-law, Rabbi Gorem's brother-in-law, they tried to convince the Israeli government to allow building a synagogue on the northern part of the Temple Mount. The northern part of the, part of, of the Temple Mount was not originally part of the Temple Mount. This is why that part of the Mount, of the court, is not sanctified in the Kedusha, in the sanctity of the Temple. Because it was outside, it was annexed by Herod and Chazal, our sages, did not approve. So thanks to this, we can go near the Ktalim, near the walls, and maybe also build a little, no, a little, a little synagogue in the far part of inside the Temple Mount. When the Muslims heard it, that the Jews want to build a synagogue on the Temple Mount, they changed the name of the Temple Mount to be Al-Aqsa. Why? Al-Aqsa appears in the Quran. Not Jerusalem. Al-Aqsa appears in the Quran. And now, since we call the whole thing Al-Aqsa, we can incite the whole Islamic world that the Jews want to establish a synagogue in Al-Aqsa. This is why they brought me. However, you know, in Arabic they say, liars should have good memory. El kazab lazim yakun zakur. Zakur means good zikaron, good memory. Al-Aqsa originally was not in Jerusalem. According to Islamic sources, the original Al-Aqsa in the days of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was near a town or village in Saudi Arabia of today, between Mecca and Taif, and that place was named Jirana. I will talk about this more elaborately tomorrow in Beit Ahmed, Beit Yehuda. Yet, what we all have to bear in mind, that the Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem is an invention of the Umayyads, 50 years after Muhammad died, they moved the Al-Aqsa from, no, they didn't move anything, they just named the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, Al-Aqsa, in order to divert the Hajj from Mecca to Jerusalem because of a rebellion which erupted in Mecca. So the whole thing about Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem is fake news already from the 7th century. And today, they continue to perpetuate the fake news of the 7th century, which were concocted because of political problems which they had in the 7th century. Again, tomorrow night, we'll speak about this in Beit Ahmed Bet Yehuda in much more wider uh, way. So, today they continue this fake news. So now Al-Aqsa is not only Jerusalem, now it, con it contains the whole Temple Mount. Why? Because those Jews want to build a synagogue, little synagogue, on the Temple Mount. Okay, so this is why they changed the maps. Lies, here we have. Something which people are not aware of, yet you can see it from original maps, which I can be. Not only this, even formally, beforehand, uh, Jerusalem, as you know, since the British uh, occupation of the land of Israel in, during this, the First World War, the British Empire nominated the Mufti, Haj Amir al-Husseini, to be the custodian of uh, Jerusalem from the religious point of view, uh, for the Muslims at least, if not others as well. This Mufti was a Jew hater tremendously. He is the one who uh, incited the Arabs to massacre the Jews in 1920, 1921, 1929, in Hebron, in Yafo, in Jerusalem, in Tzfat, in Tveria. All these are Yeshuva Yashan, people who were not even Zionists. They were ultra-religious people 
who were slaughtered by their neighbors after the incitement of the Mufti. This is how he hated Jews. He is the one who ignited the Big Arab Revolt between 1936 and 39. So the British chased him and he ran away to Iraq. He sat in Baghdad and incited against the Jews. So the Iraqis massacred the Jews of Iraq, of Baghdad in 1941, Chag Shavuot, what is called the Farhud. 179 Jews were slaughtered. Hundreds were injured, amputated. Women were humiliated by them for two long days of riots against the Jews, massacre. The one who was behind it was the Mufti, Hajj Amir Hussein. Not only this, he ran away from Iraq to Hitler. And there are many, much evidence about his participants participants in the final solution. Well, there is a, a debate whether he was uh, inciting the Germans or not, but in 1944, the Germans collected the Jews of Hungary in Budapest area to take them to Auschwitz. You know what for? But they were afraid that partisans will blow up the the uh, uh, bridges of the trains so Jews cannot be sent to Auschwitz. So he, the Mufti, Haj Amir al-Husseini, the founder of the Palestinian National Movement, went to Yugoslavia, went to Bulgaria, and he recruited 30,000 Waffen SS Muslims in order to guard the bridges of the trains which were supposed to, which took actually large part of the Hungarian Jewry to Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the man, the Palestinian founder, or the founder of the Palestinian National Movement. Now, this man, as a Jew hater as he was, both in words and deeds, had no problem to publish another booklet, which I have here also, which is this. This booklet, my printing is 1930. They printed it many times because this actually was the ticket to go to the Temple Mount. So uh, my, my uh, version, my uh, uh, copy is 2,997. This is the number. It's a number. Now, this man published this booklet and the title is a brief guide to Al Haram al Sharif Jerusalem. In, in English and in French, because he wanted to give it to tourists from Britain and from France. It's okay. Thank you. <coughs> Published by the Supreme Muslim Council, which he headed. He was the head of the Supreme Muslim Council. It costs 150 mils, means 15 pence. This, what I show you is 29. What I hold in my head is, a is 30. The same thing. This, the content is the same content. What does he write in this book? I want to read the whole book. I will read only two sentences. The Haram, is uh, page number four. Historical sketch, we'll read two sentences, and it's clear English. I don't even have to translate it. Its identity, means the Haram, the Temple Mount's identity, with the site of Solomon's Temple is beyond dispute. Again, the ident its identity, means the identity of the Temple Mount, of the Haram al Sharif, as they call it. The, the court of the Temple Mount. Its identity with the site of Solomon's Temple is beyond dispute. This too is the spot according to the universal belief, universal belief, including the Islamic world. Universal, right? On which, and here he quotes a verse from Shmuel Bet, David built an altar unto the Lord, 
and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Okay, the Mufti, the big Jew hater, had no problem to admit in an official book which was, a which was published by the Supreme Muslim Council under his leadership that the Temple Mount is the site of Solomon's Temple, means the Haram Sharif, and even his father, David, did what he did. Today, every Muslim whom you can ask, clerics and others, there was never a temple. Temple, if, if there was any, maybe in Sinai, maybe in Shechem, where the Southern Samaritans still uh, keep their, their worship, maybe in heaven, well, there's no evidence that it was here in Jerusalem, and it's, it's a concoction by the Jews. This is what they say today. Excuse me? Did they read what he published? And, and I uh, once asked one of them. So he looked at this, he says, well, this looks like a Zionist forgery. <laughs> this was published by Zionists. And it was not 1930, not 92. It was after the state was established. And you actually forged it. And you write uh, Supreme Muslim Council. Okay, this is, this is in libraries in many countries in the world. So Israel succeeded to stick it to every library in the world? Okay? Lies. But the thing that Jews are forging things were not invented recently. First of all, already the Islam from the beginning claims that Judaism is based on a forgery of the Holy Scriptures because the Jews forged the Bible. How? The Jews erased every mention of Muhammad in the Bible. <laughs> How do they know? One time they left in Shira Shirim, Vekulo Mahmadim. <laughs> Evidently, this is what they left, and this is a proof that the, all the other occurrences of Muhammad, they erased. See, this by, by the way, Allah got angry at the Jews, threw them to exile, and took the gospel from them again to the Christians, who also, Raya Rua Baddalu, means forged and changed. So Allah also took the gospel from them, and now it gave the, Allah gave the gospel to the Muslims, who are the real custodians of the word of Allah, and they will never change and never uh, 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 omit anything because they are faithful to Allah unlike Jews and Christians. Okay? This is the Islamic theory about how Jews forge things <coughs> in, in their favor. So it didn't start with the maps of the Jordanians or the Palestinians. It started already in the 7th century. They claim that Jews are forging Holy Scriptures. This is in ancient times. Recent times, we see it on right, left, and center. First of all, uh, years ago, I was watching the Jordanian uh, uh, TV. Jordanian TV, those days, I'm talking about some 20 years ago, uh, had a very interesting habit. During the day, like between 10 o'clock in the morning and the 4 or 5 afternoon, uh, when people are at work, Few people are at home watching TV. So in, in, <coughs> instead of producing talk shows, they did something, in my view, very nice. They put cameras in the university, in different classes, physics, biology, history, whatever, psychology, social sciences. They, every like hour and a half, they had another class, and people could sit at home and study and be like in class between you and me, much better way how to fill the day in a TV channel rather than <coughs> talk shows about things which nobody interested. So I was once watching a lesson in history. A professor stands in the University of Amman. Class look like uh, uh, students of like 30, 40 years old, means 
MA or PhD, and he tells them something which I almost ran to the calendar to see if it's not April 1st. <laughs> what he says that the Bible, the Bible was authored by the Zionists after 1948 in order to justify the existence of the state of Israel. The Bible was written by the Zionists after 1948 in order to justify the existence of the state of Israel. And nobody of the class, not even one, raises the hand to ask a very simple question. Tell me, my dear teacher, is the Septuaginta, the 70 uh, translation to Greek, which was written in the 3rd century BCE, was also authored by the Zionists after 1948? Was the Volgata translation to Latin, which was made in the 1st century CE, also was written or forged by the Zionists after 1948? And all those uh, manuscripts of the Bible in English and French, which are bound with, with chains in museums and uh, libraries in Europe, which were handwritten in the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, before print came to the world, are these also Israeli modern forgery after 1948? Yes. Okay, of course. So what I mean that somebody <coughs> can stand and without blinking, with a poker face, say the most stupid thing that the Bible, okay, maybe, maybe we can say about some book which nobody heard, but the Bible, which the whole world knows about, and was translated to who knows how many languages, who knows when in history, okay, Middle Ages, Spanish, Portuguese, so many, these are also, all these translations to who knows how many la languages are also written by the Zionists after 48. Okay, this kind of lie is so easy to refute, but nobody raises his hand, and nobody asks. And today, this is what people in the Arab world believe, that the whole thing is forged by the Zionists. But this is not the only problem of lies which uh, occur. I want to show you something. A sheikh means a learned man, sits in Al Jazeera, and tells his viewers, I, I took part in this, but I'm not part of what I'm going to show you. I want to show you what he says. What I answered is something different. لا يشك عاقل بعروبة فلسطين ولا يشك عاقل ولا منصف ولا مؤرخ بإسلامية فلسطين هي أرض الكنعانيين للأوائل عاشوا فيها منذ آلاف السنين أما الصهاينة واليهود فقد مروا بها بدو رحل لم يبنوا بها حضارة Miss the Jews in the land of Israel first temple, second temple they never lived there they just wandered in the Middle East and they didn't build anything in the land of Israel. They didn't leave anything in the ground of, the, of Eretz Israel. And the reason for that is that the authors of the Quds and the authors of Palestine, 80% of them are the authors of Islam. 18% of them are the authors of Messiah. And 2% of them are the authors of Islam. Messiah? Eighty percent Islamic, eighteen percent Christian, two percent Canaanites. Altogether, hundred percent means Jews did not leave anything in the ground. لم يجد مع الحفريات الظالمة الطاغية من الكيان الصهيوني لم يجد حجرا واحدا ولا أثرا واحدا كل تزوير وكل كذب وكل افتراء يحاولون أن يوجدوا تاريخ من اللا تاريخ This is 
what not he only said this is today the common knowledge in the Arab world that in the land of Israel any finding which bears Jewish nature is a forge, forgery by the Zionists I won't show more because this in my view is the peak of that program of that episode Although I took part in this, I said what I said. But this is the kind of lies which we have to face today. That Jews were not there. Okay, I can give you many, many more kinds of lies. I, I don't want. Let's, what we show. The maps, the 18 and the 80, 18 and 2, and all kinds of. And of course, the, what happens with archaeology is nothing is done. Is he Palestinian? No, he is Syrian. But uh, he is, uh, like, from his ideological point of view, I would ca ca categorize him as like Al Qaeda guy. He was one of the supporters of uh, Jabhat and Nusra, uh, and like the Al Qaeda. But. Is he still alive? Of course! This is what they want to hear. Okay. So, the question is, how can we... Counter it. What can you do against it? How can you counter it? How can you combat such a, 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 I would say a web of lies which, were, which was created by these speakers that everything there is for The Bible is forged. And all the antiquities are forged. This is a tough job because it is not restricted to the state of Israel. Because if Jews, wherever they are in the world, support the state of Israel, they actually support an entity which was established on a lie. That the Jews ever lived there, the Jews have any connection to Eretz Israel, and this is why. They hate not only the Jews who live in the Eretz Israel, they hate the Jews also in California, in Poway, and of others, of course, or wherever they are. Because Jews support Israel by definition as they see it. So it's not only the Jews of Israel. And where did the Jews of Israel come from? From Poland, from Morocco, from Iraq, from this state, from them. Okay, so this, the whole thing is based on nothing, on forgery. So it's not only upon of the Israelis. It's upon of all the Jews who still adhere to a religion which is false according to Islam, still believe in the Bible which was written by the Zionists after 1948, and still pray to Eretz Israel, although Eretz Israel was nothing because the Jews only came and, came and left as Bedouins, not, not build, didn't build anything, let alone... Uh, Beit Mikdash or Temple. Okay? So, this is why all the Jews live in lie according to their uh, uh, <laughs> interpretation of history and whatever. How can we fight it? How can we combat it? How can we negate it? How can we say something about this? When everything which we say is viewed as a lie. Of course, we can say that Israel has the right to exist according to international law, CILR, okay, okay. the documents for those. But, when, we, when I tell them that Balfour Declaration, San Remo uh, 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 Convention, and the other said, excuse me, who gave Balfour the country to give it to the Jews? But it belonged to, to, to Balfour. He got it from his father, from his grandfather. Who the heck gave, gave him the permission to give an Islamic land to the Jews? Ah, because he was Christian? Ah, this is a conspiracy between the Christians and the Jews to take an Islamic waqf land, means a holy land for Islam, and to desecrate it by giving it to the religious Jews, to the Jews who are defiled. And this is a conspiracy. So it is illegal to begin with what Balfour did in 1917 and uh, what the League of Nations gave the Jews, the same country, in 1920 is illegal similarly because who the heck gave this land to the Japanese 
to vote, to give it to, to the Jews or to the Russians or the Austrians, whoever voted in this uh, uh, San Remo Convention. Who gave them the, the, the land to give it to the Jews? So even if it is an international document, who the heck gave it to the international community? This belongs to Islam. Because once it was under Islamic uh, uh, rule, and according to Islam, a land has only one way ticket, to enter Islam, not to get out of Islam. So who, who, who can take out the land from the Islam? More Christians, whose religion is null and void, just like Judaism. So this is how they view the documents and the decisions of the world. They couldn't care less about these things. Because Islam is the name of the game, and according to Islam, Palestine belongs entirely from the river to the sea, should be free and belong to the Muslims, not to Jews. So, for this, this is why the international arena uh, and the documents which were produced along the years by the international arena, they couldn't care less about these documents. So, we have a problem with this issue. They don't buy it. But this is not the only problem. What we have today, these lies, in my humble view, should be faced by, not, of course, international uh, documents, very important, but also by uh, scientific publications. And here we have, in both uh, arenas, the history and archaeology. History, of course, is a science which tells us what happened in the past. And this is a well-recognized, established science. You have departments in <coughs> universities which deal with history. However, history, as you know, from the linguistic point of view, history is actually story. In French, how do you say history? Histoire. How do you say story? Histoire, the same word. In Italian, history is storia, and story is storia. Okay? <coughs> so, story and history, actually the same word. Means, history is a story. He writes a story, he writes a story, she writes a story. There's a stories. Fables. Mices. So, uh, what, what is written by the Christians, by the Europeans, they don't take so seriously. The, uh, the, the other uh, science which we can do something is, is archaeology. Now, when it comes to archaeology, uh, there are in the land of Israel hundreds of thousands of findings which were found not by the Israelis. You cannot blame the Israelis for forging this. Israel is, well, the land of Israel is being dug already since the mid-19th century. A British archaeologist, for example, Catherine, Catherine Kenyon, who wrote a whole book about underground Jerusalem after she dug in Jerusalem for years. And she was British. She was not Zionist at all. What she documents about Jewish remnants in Jerusalem. So there are many others, not Jewish, who wrote about the archaeology in Jerusalem? Of course, what we uh, see also is things which we can show to the whole world. Let me show you uh, at least uh, one uh, suitcase of what can be what can be shown. This is a small, small, uh, uh, I would say, display of Jewish coins from various times between the first temple and the second temple. And I just saw a lot, not, not, not elaborate about what they are and who they are, but you can see the Jewish ancient writing in the lower part here. These are, these are Jewish coins which were found in Eretz Israel. This is in Greek, because Greek was also a language in the Middle East. It was with lingua franca in many, many centuries in the Middle East. See, these are actually uh, candelabra, uh, pamotim, candles. See, this is the Jewish ancient writing. Here also. 
made of silver. This, uh, these are uh, parchments written in Hebrew, found in Eretz Israel, especially the Megillot of Yama Melach. Okay? Who, uh, internationally recognized as Jewish uh, remnants from the Second Temple. Okay? All these are hard evidence for Jewish presence, which Jews did not come and go as Bedouins, but left civilization in the land of Israel. Okay? And there are many more I can show you. Dead Sea Scrolls. Show me? Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead, of course, yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many, many others. Ladies and gentlemen, when you employ these things which are uh, internationally recognized as original, and you can test them, carbon-14, you can test whatever you like, and to prove scientifically that they are <coughs> Jewish and belong in days where Muslims, well, the fathers of the Muslims, were still in the desert, pagan Arabs, before Islam came to the world in the 7th century, when they were still drinking wine, bearing the daughters alive, and worshipping idols and idolaters, as I keep telling them in their media, because this is, we can prove it scientifically. And this is what's important. Because, imagine, uh, somebody goes in any university where scientists uh, are scientists, real scientists, and you bring evidence, and he raises up and says, hey, the whole thing is forged after it was tested by <coughs> scientists whether in uh, chemists for carbon-14, which, which gives you the date almost <coughs> of the material, and other scienti uh, scientists, if somebody tries to say, hey, the whole thing is forgery, people will make, will make fun out of him. But don't you accept the worldwide accepted uh, science of archaeology? Archaeologists, you look, there is a Christian publication uh, Antiquities of the Holy Land. It is a, 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 a scientific publication. I think it's a, a by uh, it's six times a year it is published, every other month. And they actually give scientific articles about findings on archaeology in the land, in the land of Israel. So what? Uh, are they all uh, people who, who are occupied with, with, the, uh, with the forgery? This is what they do all day. All those uh, archaeologists... Okay? Whoever tries to claim that these things are forgery makes fun out of himself. After all, this is a well-established, recognized, proven science uh, 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 all over the world. All over the, the civilized world, world. Maybe not in there. But this is it. Ladies and gentlemen, today there is a trend which started recently in science, the investigation of indigenous people's rights of indigenous people to land. Of course, it is meant to take care of uh, all kinds of indigenous Canadians, indigenous Americans, indigenous uh, people in Central America, South America, all kinds of aborigines, in Australia, this is what this science is about. To give those peoples the recognition. Of course, they don't, no, no country wants to evaporate, neither Canada nor Australia. Yet, uh, I would say 15 years, there is some kind of awakening of investigation into the proofs which these indigenous people do have on their lands. Alan Dershowitz, the famous uh, uh, Jewish lawyer in the States, and he's not for the far right, as you can know, as you can understand. He said that the Jewish people are the prototype of indigenous people in the land of Israel. Because the quantity and the quality of Proofs which they have are way 
above any other group in the world which claims that it is indigenous to any country. The aborigines in Australia, the, uh, the original Canadians, whatever. The only nation in the world who can find coins from 2,000 or 3,000 years ago is the Jewish people in the land of Israel. The only nation in the world which can find parchments and megillot from uh, two and more thousand years ago, written in their language, written in their script, is only the Jewish people. There is not even one other nation in the world which can prove the fact that this is an indigenous people to Eretz Israel than the Jews. Should we neglect these things? And look, I'm not saying that all the other proofs like international issues are not important. Very important. But when you show a picture, I know if you say it in English as well, in Hebrew you say, Tmuna achat shava elef milim. One picture weighs like thousand words. Instead of talking, show pictures. And you know what? If we had clips taken 2,000 years ago from the temple, we could show them, but we don't have, you know, clips from those days. The cameras, the video cameras of the second temple were not in a good shape, and you cannot uh, have them today. But what you, what you find as hard evidence, look, uh, uh, mosaics with Hebrew script on them. In wherever you go in Eretz Israel, you find uh, synagogues from the first step and second step with Hebrew writing in the ground in, in this, uh, in this uh, um, uh, mosaics. You find stones above doors which have inscriptions in Hebrew from the second temple, first temple as well. So much is there and this is all recognized scientifically by scientists, by archaeologists, and this is why we, had, we have, we must add these things to everything which we do in what we call Hasbara in order to show in pictures, thousand words, in pictures what was found in the land of Israel which together is recognized scientifically by one of the most established science, science in the world, archaeology. We cannot ignore it. We should not ignore it because our forefathers used this coin. Should we abandon it? Should we forget about it? Should we allow the world to forget about this? this these are the proofs. And those who keep saying that these all, these all things, all these things are forgery in a normal scientific world they put themselves in shame. They put, you know, they, they are, everybody, everybody will make fun out of them. Whoever tries to refute these things which the whole world knows about, or at least the archaeological, the archaeological world knows about. I will, I will air like a minute or two minutes from an event which occurred in Cairo in May 1st, 2012 means seven years ago when the no Mursi was in, in his campaign to get in power because he was elected two months later okay so the campaign started in this day long uh, was only two months and this is the, uh, the, the the event which launched the Mursi campaign okay and the speaker is Safat Hagazi today is in custody. Raina Hulm al Khilafat al Islamiya Hulm Ard al Khilafa Yatahakak Bezdila Ala Yad Doctor Mohammed Mursi Waman Mahum in Ikhwani Hiwa Jamati Hiwa Hisbe Raina Al Hulm al Kabir Aladi Nahlumubihi Jamian Al Wilayat al Mutahid al Arabiya الولايات المتحدة العربية ستعود إن شاء الله ستعود الولايات المتحدة العربية على يد هذا الرجل ومن معه إن شاء الله 
ستكون عاصمة الخلافة ستكون عاصمة الولايات المتحدة العربية هي القدس إن شاء الله القدس إن شاء الله Miss Jerusalem will be the capital of the United Arab States, which will be united by Muhammad Morsi, insha'Allah. Takbir! Takbir! ستكون عاصمتنا ليست القاهرة ولا مكة ولا المدينة وإنما القدس insha'Allah. Okay, he repeats it. For the Muslim Brotherhood mindset, Jerusalem should be the capital of the United Arab States, which will be united under the Muslim Brotherhood with the leadership of Muhammad Morsi. Okay? This is what Jews, in order to extract Jerusalem from Judaism, so Jews will go away to wherever they can, because without Zion, there is no Zionut. Without Jerusalem, there is no Zionism, because the word Zion actually is one of the names of Jerusalem. So this is why they want Jerusalem. To a degree, that the Palestinians, they produce this scarf, which I bought, 10 shekels in Jerusalem. <laughs> it started in 50. <laughs> this is produced by the PLO. This is the flag of the PLO. So on this side, it says Al-Quds Lana. Jerusalem is ours. Since when? Never mind. Jerusalem is ours. You know, industry of lies. Okay. But on the other side, Palestine. The whole country. Palestine. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Okay? Right. Now, it, it, this is on one scarf. This is one thing. And the connection is that they know that if they have Jerusalem, they will have the whole country. This is why they hammer on the issue of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is not yet considered worldwide as the Israeli capital. First of all, the Canadian embassy is not in Jerusalem. So therefore, Jerusalem is a, is a weak link in the chain of Israel. If they spoke about Tel Aviv, people would throw them away. But they speak on Jerusalem, this is legitimate. Why? Because Jerusalem is not yet recognized as Israeli soil and an Israeli capital. And this is why they concentrate on Jerusalem, hoping that one day it will be theirs. And when this occurs, Israel will be wiped out because the Jews will lose their hope to be in their forefathers' land. This was about building in Jerusalem when the Israeli government decided in the eve of Yom Yerushalayim of 2008 to build some hundreds, some hundreds of apartments in Har Choma and Pisgat Ze'ev, two neighborhoods which were annexed to Jerusalem after the Six-Day War. Of course, the Muslims and the Arabs didn't like it, and the Jihad channel Al Jazeera dedicated 15 minutes in its main news bulletin of days that evening to this issue. Ladies and gentlemen, 15 minutes to one, one item, it's a hell of a lot of time. In the beginning, they brought a reportage from their uh, correspondent in Jerusalem, and she makes the impression, she doesn't say it clearly, but she creates the impression <coughs> that Israel destroys all the Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem out, out from the walls in order to build Jewish neighborhoods over their ruins. Then they bring another a guy from the Palestinian Authority who claims that Israel broadens Jerusalem all over the West Bank. And they looked for an Israeli to bash him on air. So they went to the, they, they tried with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They didn't want to get into this. Other speakers in Arabic in Israel, there are not many, uh, couldn't. And they uh, invited me to the studio in order to bash me on air. I'm in Tel Aviv here. And this is Jamal Rayan, the, the chief broadcaster and the mind, uh, super, uh, sorry, mastermind of Al Jazeera, the editor of Al Jazeera. 
He is in charge of warding. He is in charge of who will come or not to come. And he is actually the most important person in Jazeera. And he is a Palestinian. And he is in Qatar. I am in Jerusalem. I am in Tel Aviv. Try to, uh, uh, to uh, an interview about building in Jerusalem. Sayyid, Sayyid Murdakhai, هذا القرار هل هو دق مزيد من الأسافين في نعش المفاوضات الفلسطينية الإسرائيلية؟ أنا حقيقة لا أفهم هذا الكلام. هل على إسرائيل أن تبحث عن إذن من أين في العالم؟ هذه عاصماتنا منذ ثلاثة ألاف عام وكنا هناك عندما كان آباؤكم يشربون الخمر ويأيدون البنات ويعبدون العزة واللات والمنات فلماذا علينا أن نتكلم عن هذا الشيء؟ هذه هي مديناتنا من ثلاثة ألاف عام وإلى أبد الآخر يا بخير إذا كنت تريد عفوا عفوا سيد مردخاي عفوا عفوا عفوا, عفواً إذا كنت تريد أن تتحدث عن التاريخ أيضا نحن نتحدث عن القرآن لا يمكن لك أن تلغي القدس من القرآن أرجوك أن تبتعد عن الألفاظ التي تسيء للعرب والمسلمين رجاء لنبقى في موضوعنا لنبقى في موضوعنا لو سمح الآن هذا القرار لا يتعارض لم يرد ذكر القدس في القرآن سبحان الذي أسرى بعبد ذكر القدس أوكي. لم يرد في القرآن ولو سي... مرة واحدة يا سيدي لنت... نتحدث بالسياسة عفوا لنتحدث بالسياسة الجزيرة أوكي this is it continues I'll stop here I'll fast forward seven and a half years from this occasion, from this occurrence. This was June 1st, 2008. End of December 2015, seven and a half years later, this man sits and talks about his policy vis-a-vis -vis Israelis in Al Jazeera. And he is the mastermind of Al Jazeera. Okay? Let me show you what the man is saying. Why do you say that you are not going to be Israeli? I am the opposite. I am the one who is going to be a leader. I am the one who is going to be an Israeli in any period of time. I am the one who is going to be a leader. Because if he wants to give a letter, I am able to give this letter. الجزيرة تعتمد على الرأي والرأي الآخر وعدم وجود طرف ثاني تصبح يعني صوت واحد وغير مقنع ناوي القضايا الفلسطينية بحس إني منبر للدفاع عن القضية الفلسطينية طبعا في في بعض الأحيان لا تكلو مواقف صعبة بالنسبة لي حينما أقابل إسرائيلي أعطيك مثال كان معي بروفيسور من جامعة بار إيلان اسمه وردخاي كيدار وكانت المقابلة مضمون المقابلة وهدف المقابلة هو الحديث عن أسباب استمرار الاستيطان في الضفة الغربية والتوسع الاستيطاني في القدس وغير ذلك فطرحت عليه هذا السؤال شو الهدف فقال لي القدس لليهود نقطة هذه عاصمتنا من أبد الآبدين أنتوا العرب والمسلمين لما كنتوا في القدس كنتوا تشربون الخمر وتؤيدون البنات يشربون الخمر ويؤيدون البنات ويعبدون العزة واللات والمنات فلماذا علينا أن نتكلم عن هذا الشيء؟ هذه هي مديناتنا من ثلاثة ألاف عام فقلت له إذا كنت تريد أن تتحدث عن التاريخ لا يمكن لك أن تلغي القدس من القرآن طبعا هو دكتور فهمان قال لي القدس لم ترد في القرآن فعلا القدس لم ترد في القرآن ولكن الله أسعفني في تلك اللحظة وقلت له سبحان, سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ذكر القدس أوكي. لم يرد في القرآن ولا مرة واحدة أوكي ladies and gentlemen I spoke yesterday in Long Island believe me I don't remember what I spoke about last night the man the man remembers something which happened seven and a half years earlier remembers what the word remembers my name my the name of the university although he didn't he did not interview me ever since 
ever since okay and this man read my lips he is the strongest person in the arab world why he holds to the heaviest stick named al jazeera if he wants to kill somebody politically he can do it in no time <coughs> by fake news which he can air from al jazeera or real news which he keeps in the archives of al jazeera and they do keep a uh, sensitive information about people about leaders about kings about prime ministers and about everybody who is important in the middle east to a rainy day when this person starts to behave in a way which they do not like they start disseminating information about the man and there are much there is much of, of proof to this what they do they actually accumulate information which people leak to them wikileaks and they keep the information and when the qatar which broadcast al jazeera al jazeera wants to bash somebody they air those news so they do have archives so this is the man and he by the way he tweets against me every montag and on stick because uh, he doesn't like me he still remember my name everything okay this what i mean by being meaningful being significant after an interview in al jazeera if the if the man who is the strongest man in the arab world keeps i would say post traumatic <laughs> keeps being post traumatic because of what happened and you can when he speaks if you see if so his ticks all his ticks come out uh, when he talked about me this is why I, what i think is that israel and those who speak for israel should not let the world ignore the proofs which we have on our forefathers land and let the others sink in their lies thank you so much